because the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament is so huge, and that's what Jesus came to prepare it. Jesus came, his teaching were mainly to gap between these two covenants. And so everything almost he says, I can go through every single one of those and talk about, here he's talking about this. Here's, why? Because he is preparing the Jews for the new covenant, which they hadn't known much about. It. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Old Testament, all the prophets of the Old Testament, God kept the idea of Gentiles becoming one with the Jews a secret thing for many reasons. Church was not known uh, to the Old Testament saints. When they looked across the, uh, the span of time and prophesied, all they could see was the tip of that mountain they saw at the end, which was the Jewish kingdom. They didn't see the valley. They didn't see the lower part where God calls all the nations of the earth to join there. So they couldn't, none of them, very few of them, very few small prophecies here and there, but mainly all the 38 books, or even 39, because God called Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, it was about Israel. And so everything they talked about was all about Israel. And so when Jesus came, now it's a new idea coming to the scene. That would be hard for them to get it. They couldn't have got it. They, they couldn't understand it. So Jesus had to bring all these examples and talk about old covenant versus the new covenant. Even the apostles of the Lord that walk with the Lord. Peter, you know, he walked with Jesus for three and a half years. After that, Paul in Galatians chapter 2 uh, refers to when he went to Jerusalem first when he got saved three years and then 14 years later he went back to Jerusalem and he met Peter and 17 years, there must have been about 20 some years that Peter has been an apostle, a, a pillar of the church. Yet, even Peter didn't understand. You can see that in Acts chapter 10, when God gave him that vision of that table with all sort of animal on it that was forbidden for Jews. Peter kept saying, no, I'm not going to eat from it. God wasn't talking about food to Peter. He's talking about Gentiles. Hey, Gentiles are being added to the church. This is a new covenant. Get this. Accept this. You have the Holy Ghost. You've got to understand this. But Peter refused. Even some 20-some years later, meeting with Peter, meeting with Paul, Paul is sitting there, Jews are sitting there, all he, he or Gentiles are there in the room. Peter is sitting, eating with Gentiles. Then a group of Jews walk in, and Peter pulls out, and he says, no, no, I'm not going to sit with you guys because I'm going to offend the brethren. What? Peter Paul said, Peter, you're a hypocrite. Can you imagine what a boldness this guy had? And he was a prophet to start with and then an apostle. A prophet is not somebody you pay him $20,000 to come in a church and put him on a pedestal and uh, let him prophesy about the weather or tomorrow or this or that. A prophet is someone that is not our friend. The prophet is someone who knows the format of the new covenant. The prophet is someone who will walk into a church and say, A, B, C, D, E, F, all these ground that you have laid on the foundation of this church, they all are against the work of Jesus. That's a prophet. And to be honest with you, I, don't, I haven't seen one today. I don't know of anyone who's maybe they're called, they're calling for sure there, but I don't, I don't know of anyone who's operating under that because... Anyhow, I don't want to speak foolishly. Okay, so now Paul says, uh, so a Christian can be carnal and a Christian can be uh, spiritual based on their growth level. Uh, but very interesting, Paul says, let's go back to uh, Romans 7, 5. He says, the sinful flesh or pas sinful passions, that old nature, were aroused, NIV says awakened, by the law. Well, that's a strange thing Paul's saying here. Almost offensive in his time, offensive today. I went to Israel one year and I preached Jesus. Some people came to me 
The Lord spoke to me. I prayed all night. I said, don't give me a message that throw me out of this country. <laughs> it's my fear whenever I go to Israel. He said to me in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm praying all night. He said, Israel is a kingdom, but it lacks a king. I stood up and I preached this in a big conference the following day. Some of the pastors, leading pastors of that country came to me and said, that what you are saying is anti-Semitic. I preach Jesus, that Israel's king is Jesus, and they called me anti-Semitic. I said, Lord, I'm not going back there. I'm not preaching for these people anymore. I got to preach about the land, because that's what most of them preach about, the land. They've made it into a definite article, the land. I told one of them, I said, you have become God's dirt attorney. You know dirt attorney? People that buy dirt. You become God's dirt attorney. I said, God gave this land to Abraham before all of you were here, before any of you said anything, before you were born in this land. God gave it to one man. He doesn't need you to defend him and argue with Arabs about this piece of land and hinder him his salvation. Keep saying, the land is ours, the land is ours, the land is ours. Uh, he said, he said, or I was a she, she said, preach this to us. I said, every time I come here and preach, they call me anti-Semitic. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I don't know how I'm getting on these subjects. <laughs> Must be God's talking to somebody out there. But uh, notice, we're aroused, awakened by the law. What? Uh, this word that he uses here, passions, sinful passions. Let me go to the board here. It's the word uh, pathema. Pathema. Uh, it comes from the word pascho, which means passions, impulses, affections, or strong inward emotions. Overwhelming impulses to think and do contrary to what God desires. Evil. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, notice, he says in verse 3, Among whom also we, talking about the Jews, see, this idea that we are a group of, a uh, special group of people, we're all going to be saved, we don't need Jesus, that's nonsense. Among whom also we, referring to, because he's Ephesians, He's talking to the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, You were all dead in your trespasses, in your former conduct. And then he says, in verse 3, he says, talking about the Jews. He says, Among whom also we, the Jews, all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, talking about Jews, children of wrath. Can you imagine? Just as the others. We were children of wrath, including Jews. So, <clears throat> why would Paul say the law that is holy, God's command, 613 of them. Why would the law cause the sin to come alive, be aroused, be awakened, receive a strength? Uh, Amplify says awakened too. Why? Because the old nature, Adam's nature, remember what Paul said to Ephesians chapter 5 or 6? He says, you were once darkness. He didn't say you were in the darkness. He says you were darkness. That's Satan's nature. Man became united with Satan. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews in John chapter 8 verse 44? They said, oh, we're of our father Abraham. He said, you're of your father the devil and you do the desire of your father the devil. He said that to the leader of the Jewish people. No wonder they didn't like him. He said, you do the desire of your father. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. That's what mankind is. Man is more than a sinner. Mankind is sin, is darkness. No matter how much you upgrade him, you know, have you seen these monkeys? They put lipstick on them. They put nice dresses, suit on them. They, look, they make them look cute, but they still jump up and down. They're still a monkey. 
no matter what you do with the human being, humanism has tried to do that. Humanism has put lipstick on humanity and all mankind, especially out here in California. They're master about lipstick, lipsticking monkeys. They hug trees out here. And they say, we, we love everybody. Everybody's welcome to come in here in this territory. We're all welcome. All those criminals, we, we have sanctuary, not cities, we have sanctuary state now. <laughs> they're lipsticking, they're lipsticking, they're putting suit on these uh, people that commit murder and rape. And they say, we, 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 all, we all want, we, it's globalism, it's, everybody's okay, everybody's good. Socialism, humanism, mother of all sinful acts of mankind. And, uh, but you can upgrade a devil. A devil is a devil. You put lipstick on him, he's still a devil. His nature is still the same. Man is sin. No matter what you do to him, no matter how much you educate him, no matter how many degrees you give him, and the best places and the best car you drive him, he is still sin. There's no remedy for him. Uh, look at what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, I'm reading from Philip's translation, You yourselves who were strangers to God, and in fact through the evil things you had done, his spiritual enemies, he calls us God's own enemies. We were fighting God. He has now reconciled through the death of his body on the cross. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Notice. For if when we were enemies, all of us, without exception, religious, non-religious, Christians, non-Christians, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So now, the law was God principle. The law was God's format, God's mindset, God's emotions, God's action. And when the law came, that nature that was in us was Satan's nature, came alive. Ah, I'm going to fight against you. It's like when the war between Iran and Iraq, if you, or, or Korea, <laughs> it's more relevant, North Korea and South Korea, they were the same people but they were enemies. You put them in front of each other, they would cut each other's throat off, behead one another. It's like ISIS and Christians. ISIS people hate Christians. And they would do anything to get rid of all Christians on this planet Earth. So, when the law came, ISIS got all excited. When Christian churches started growing, ISIS said, we've got to do something about this. That's exactly what happened when the law came. When the law came, that fallen nature came alive. It said, ah! And rebelled against the law. So in a sense, Augustine explains it this way. He says, explains the sinful nature and the inaction of the law. He says, the law is not at fault, but our evil and wicked nature, even as a heap of lime is still and quiet until water is poured on it, but then it begins to smoke and burn, not from the fault of the water, but from the nature of the lime, which will not endure it. Same thing as uh, soda, soda, uh, what do you call them, powder? Soda, no, not soda powder. The stuff that they put into the... Uh, Pancake, what do they call them? So, so, ah. ah. You know, baking soda. Baking soda. You add water to baking soda, there's a reaction. Not because of the water, because you pour water over your hand, nothing happens. But because that which is in baking soda causes that reaction. Same with human nature. When you put that law before them, then they all go crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I used to live in Houston, and on weekends sometimes I used to drive to Galveston. I don't know how many hours it is, a few hours drive, to go just to the coast, you know, get a fresh uh, 
hot air from the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there was a hotel in uh, Texas, in Galveston, uh, <clears throat> on the shore of the Gulf of Mexico. Each room faced the Gulf. And they had a sign inside of each room. They said, no fishing from the balcony. But every day, hotel guests would throw their lines and fish from their balcony. <laughs> Most likely they were from Ohio. <laughs> and uh, the management didn't know how to stop them. You know what they did? They removed the sign from the room. Nothing about fishing. It's something on the inside of, and it stopped. Isn't that interesting? When they saw that sign, don't fish, they thought, oh, I'm going to fish. They got excited. Wow, who, who would fish from their hotel room? I wouldn't, would you? But when that sign says, don't do it, then they started doing it. Now, the more we use the law, the more there is breaking of it. I believe one of the reasons preachers' kids and strict Christian parents' kids rebel and they go into the world, it's because they put so much uh, restriction on them. Do this, don't do this, do's and don'ts. Don't do this, don't go there, no party, no friends, no, th no this, no that. And they put them in a cage and once these kids came to an uh, area where they had the free choice like college, they went crazy. I've got many examples of it. I didn't do that with my kids. I put a right principle before them. I said, listen, this way, if you, if you go this way, it's going to hurt you. When you're 18, you can do anything you want. But up to that point, here are, so I, 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 I talked to them, I, I walked with them, I I fed them so that they may understand. And you know what? They never rebelled. They never rebelled. They had some emotions sometimes, would want to express it. My daughter especially, she had some emotions sometimes. And I remember one day she came to me and says, Dad, you are so right. I said, of course I am. I'm your father. God had to give me that rightness to lead you. And so... Whenever they put the law, especially when they mess with the law of Moses, because that, that, it's got a category of its own for rebellious. That's like, that's like, it's major league rebellious type. Every time a preacher uses the law of Moses, for instance, on tithing, our church in Stockholm, my pastor, I loved him, He's, he was my father in the Lord. He preached so hard on tithing, and the church was always in need. Always in need. Why? Because if there's a law, they said 3 to 6% of all Christians, those who tithe, tithe. Why? Because they preach so much about it. In our church, in our mostly refugee Iranian church, I hardly say anything about money. And they are the most generous group of people that I have seen. If they have it, even sometimes they don't have it, they give. Why? Because giving is in their makeup of this new birth. God wrote the law in their spirit man in the New Testament. All you have to do is just feed that spirit man, let it come alive, let it grow, and then it will, it will work. So <clears throat> be careful when you use the law to foster somebody. That's deadly dangerous. We have results of it in the 1920s, you know, when they had that prohibition law about alcoholism, that road prohibition or whatever it's called, I don't know the history of it, but look at how much America was hurt because of it. Now, there is a, you know, you have to, there's a limit to this, so now we say everything's free, let's go. Now they're trying to do that. But these politicians are not freeing drugs because they want to be less drugs. they freeing it up because they want the tax money. They want that money to go in their pockets and spread their poison. That's what they want for. They're not thinking about this is going to stop drug uh, expansion in America. But uh, <clears throat> be 
Be careful when, when you use the law to foster somebody. A, 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 a person came to me and said, Pastor, he came to our conference. His pastor told him, if you do not come three services in our church, you have to leave our church. I said, what? That's how they control people, especially these third world countries, churches, you know. They're starting off and they bring that same spirit of Islam, controlling Islam into their church services. And it's the, I said, it's like going to a restaurant and you like the food of that restaurant. The owner says, if you want to eat here, you have to only eat in this restaurant. What kind of nonsense is that? I never tell our people, come, don't come. Come only here. Don't go anywhere else. Listen, if you feed them enough, if you feed them good enough, everybody knows when they eat a good food. Everybody, <laughs> without exception. You feed them, you give them the truth. They want to go and get, they go after it. They search the earth over to find that which is good for them. People do that. Spend ton of money on organic stuff. <laughs> so uh, you got to be careful. Now, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Notice, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's why the law came. The law came to bring that which was under surface above the surface. That's why the law came. The law came to strengthen sin. Can you imagine? The purpose of the law was to strengthen sin. And you put those Ten Commandments in the courtrooms of America, you're increasing criminals. You put a banner and you go in the streets and you say abortion is killing a baby according to the law of God. You know what you do? You increase abortion in this country. It will pass the law to kill babies. I believe most problem we have in this country is because of religious people. I promise you that. In the old days when they used the law to condemn people, it had a counter effect. Notice that this translation in NASB, which is the closest to Greek. The law came in so that the transgression, oh, I love this would increase. Can you imagine? The law came in so that the transgression would increase. What does it mean transgression would increase? Transgression was already in there, but it was hidden. Envy was there, but people didn't know they had envy. Jealousy was there. Lying was there. They didn't know what they're lying. They thought it's natural because everybody lies in their culture. But when the law came, said, if you lie, if you're jealous, you got to bring, can you imagine being in the camp of Israel? Remember that the tent, the tent of tabernacle, the tabernacle was in the midst of all the tribes of Israel in the desert. I got four minutes. So if you divide 12 tribes into four north, south, east, west, you get three tribes on each section, north, side, east, west. And imagine three million people in the desert. That's a long distance from if you were in the back of the, in the back, your tent was all the way back in the outskirt of the, uh, the, their town. Or they didn't have a town. They were in the desert. But, you know, at three million people, that's like, that's like Orange County or even bigger than Orange County. And so uh, it would take you a while to bring in your gift. And those gifts or your sacrifice, some of those sacrifices were alive sacrifice. You couldn't hide them. Like if you brought a, she, she goat, everybody knew what she goat is all about, you know, and you're yanking that she goat across all these tents, and everybody walks out of their tent and say, ha, Reza, he's, 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 ah. they all talk about you. Imagine the conscience, the consciousness or consciousness of sin that they all possessed in Israel. You imagine how sin became all of a sudden it was a spread throughout the whole camp. I read a story. I was in Italy one time. read a story in the, one of the magazine. There is a, an area in, in Italy where most of the apple, everything apple comes from that area. Uh, they have apple sauce, apple cake, apple this, apple soup. I mean, it's all apple. And the story is behind it. It's a true story that the priest was tired of people coming confessing 
adulterous sin to them, to him. So he said, if you have committed adultery in, that, in his booth, you know, confession booth, he says, go plant an apple tree. He, uh, apparently he liked apple. <laughs> they started planting so many apple trees that they, they say all the apple from Italy and even across the border comes from this region of Italy. They all know this region are adulterers in Italy. Can you imagine? In the camp of Israel, everybody knew who everybody else has done. They all knew it. It wasn't a booth you go inside and the guy come confess and you close the door. Because your sacrifice indicated according to the law what kind of sin you have committed. And everybody saw it. You couldn't hide a big bull or a sheep goat or a dove under your basket and in the middle of the night to go in there. No. Think about it. How God exposed. Ah. Thank God we don't live in that time. I can imagine what a time they had in that time. Notice what Paul says. He says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And you use the law? You condemn people every time you do it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You say, well, tithing is not of the law. Yet you read Malachi 3.10. You tell people, if you don't give, you're not going to be blessed. Windows of heaven are not going to be open to you. So you pick and choose the law. Pick, choose, pick, choose. Uh, this is good. This is going to give money to the church. We're going to use this. Hallelujah. New Living Translation says, man, today was rough. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God. You, you, you go and you say Sabbath is our root and you start holding Sabbath. What, what you want to offend God? Is that what you're doing? You, you think sitting in a corner and not moving, not turning any light on, not turning your TV on, your phone. It's impossible today really to keep Sabbath. Because everything electronic is against the law of Moses. Everything that tends fire, electricity is fire, it's against the law. And, and, and you want to keep Sabbath to do what now? You want to be at rest? For more of Pastor Reza's teachings and materials, please visit our website at www.rezasafa.com.